This video is like one I haven't done ever before. This is a whole new paradigm of knowledge and information. Make sure you watch it all the way through to the end. Apollo had produced the ultimate hardware wallet for your cryptocurrency assets, probably the most secure hardware wallet going. Use my affiliate link and the code for a discount. To find the best cryptocurrency investments, check out Token Metrics. Use my affiliate link for a discount. Take the first step towards online privacy. Get NordVPN. Hey, Stephen, thank you so much for making yourself available. That's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, Rich. You are so, so welcome. And just a little bit about our background and how we met. I think it was maybe six weeks ago, I was, um, during my day job, I, I made a call to your wife or somebody had recommended you and I reached out to you and I spoke to your wife. She said, he's available this evening in this city. And I said, good, I want to go and see him. I want to go and see him. So I came to see you. We didn't know each other at all. Never met before. You don't know anything about me. And then you gave me this reading, a psychic reading. And there were things that you told me about my life that were accurate. And I was like, there's no way you could have known that. You told me stuff about my mom that had passed away um, over 17 years ago. It's like, no way he could have known that. And then curiously, and I've said this to you, Stephen, uh, since October, I have had readings from five, five psychics. Three of them I thought were really, really good, really, really good. And I would highly recommend. You're one of those three. And all three of them said stuff that was the same about my marriage, about my 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 mom, about money, about this, about that. It just overlapped. I was like, what is going on? What is going on? So I thought, one, I'd invite you here so that people can find out about your the great work that you do. And, sh you know, should they want to go and pursue it, we'll have details in the description below how they can reach out to you. And then also, because I'm curious, you know, Bitcoin is this other paradigm for money. And you have access to this other paradigm of knowledge and experience so that's why i invited you on so thank you so much anything you want to say just to get us going well no, i'm really pleased you've asked me to come on because um i see an awful lot of people every day and i've been working in this field for now it's incredible how time goes by but i've been working in this field for about 30 years and it was always an interest of mine that there's far more to the human consciousness or the the mind or how the, the mind and the brain works together, and to access maybe different understanding or different levels of understanding or consciousness, which would give us insight to maybe some of the questions that have been asked since time began. And so even as a child, <clears throat> uh, my mum used to say that um, I'd come to her and say, mum, I don't want to be in that room. There's, there's something or there's someone in that room. And my mum and dad would come up and they'd check the room out and they'd say, don't be so silly. There's nothing in the room, but I, I could see somebody in the room. I could sense spirits there. And my brother would never want to share a room with me because he, it would be terrifying for him because he would always be dreaming or having nightmares. And he'd say he could see me just sitting up and I would sometimes look as if I was half asleep, but as if I was talking to somebody. And that was going on for years and years when I was a child. But then, then you hit puberty and things like that and it all stopped, really. And I'd forgot all about it. And um, But then what 30 years ago or 57 now 30 years ago it started again and i decided that to me life life was boring i'll be honest mm. the thought of just repeating the same day over and over and i remember my father saying to me son when you go to work that's when you'll feel as if like there's a purpose that's what he said and i thought oh, well i'll wait for the work thing okay so rich i thought i'll wait for the work so my first day at work i was waiting for this crescendo this this moment it didn't come. And on the way home, I was thinking, oh, my God, this is life, is it? This is life. There's got to be more to this, and I want to know what it is. What is our potential? What are we capable? Are we using just a small part of our mind? And science tells us we are. What is it? One-tenth of our brain is used? I believe it's because one-tenth of our mind is used. So I decided to use certain techniques in order to develop my mind using meditation. And through using these meditation techniques, the byproduct of that is not only do you become more, well, a nicer person, more calm, happier, more contented, but the gifts of the psychic gifts come. It's just like a byproduct. And that is the gift of 
clairvoyance, being able to see into the future, to see things, to sense things. Clairaudience, you actually can hear uh, somebody speaking to you. And clairsentience, which is where you get a sense in the stomach and knowing, you know, that gut feeling. Well, this is like heightened hundreds of times more. And once you've got this, and this is what I noticed, I was doing this for a long time. I was doing this and meditating every day, every day. And I was having the most incredible experiences. I mean, incredible experiences uh, to the point where I would know things. I, I mean, instantly, and it would be correct. Um, I, for instance, and one particular time, I remember years ago, I was introduced to this lady um, with her fiance. And as soon as I saw her, in my head, a voice said to me, this is your future wife who will bear you two children. Now, <laughs> she was standing there with her fiancé. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, this is going to be an interesting one. This is going to be an interesting experience. But, but of course, I did everything in my power just to be a friend, just to be, you know, stay back. And I've been married to her now for 25 years. And at the time, there was trouble conceiving children. And so it looked like well, the medical profession said that we weren't going to have any children. But I remember what that voice had said to me. And the voice had said to me, but you will, who will bear you two children. And we have two children. So it, it's really quite interesting. So there's good parts to this. There's amazing parts to this with this development. But then there are the scary parts. Okay, so the scary part, for instance, we were walking, me and my wife walking through the common land in Southampton. And it was quite a few years ago. It was actually 2004. And as we were going across with our little dog, something hit me. It was like a wave. It was overwhelming. And I stopped. And my wife said, are you okay? I went, no, I'm not. And she said, what, what is that? And I said, Nicola, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people are going to die in, within days. And she said, well, where? I said, I don't know. I said, it's either going to be natural or nuclear because there's, there's hundreds of thousands of people. And it was six days later that the tsunami hit, 2004, and 250,000 people died that day or over the, next, over the next few days. So those type of things, I'm not, you know, I don't really want to know. <laughs> uh, please don't tell me, you know. But, yeah. so, but what I think happens is, one thing I want to really emphasize is that what I've done or what I'm achieving, because you never get to the, end, uh, uh, to the end goal, it's continuous. It's eternal progress, I believe, open to every human soul. But what I'm doing is not a gift. It's purely open to every human being. So every human being can evolve and have these abilities. And what we do is, I think, we're, we're tapping into a universal consciousness. And But the thing is, most human beings are so wrapped up in their little lives and just trying to survive, really. You know, the, that's what they're trying to do in their lifetime. But those who do have a little bit more time, who can actually work on developing the mind using meditation techniques, you then start to become aware of a different world, a different reality. And with that comes these apparent gifts. But I just think it's just a stage of evolution. And somebody said to me, so you're saying then anybody can do this? I said, yeah, they can. They can all develop this. I said, but everybody can play football, but there's only a few George Bests. Yes, <laughs> there's only one. There was only ever one George Best. Was there? Only yeah, we're so both showing our age, right? I'll be 57 next Absolutely. month. Absolutely, <laughs> I should have said Rooney or something, shouldn't I? That's right. I should oh, have said Rooney. Even Rooney's a little bit old. I don't know who it is nowadays, <laughs> right? But, okay, uh, yeah. Know, now, for people, Maybe. most most of my viewers, uh, thank you so much for that, Stephen. I'm going to come back because a lot you said in there that I want to uh, get into, right? So most of my viewers are from the United States. So just so you know, George Best, Georgie Best, was probably the finest football player that br that <laughs> British Isles have ever produced. Got to be careful not to call him English because he was actually Northern Irish. <laughs> we'll have to we'll say Ronaldo or someone like that. He's like a Ronaldo. Isn't he? Yeah, or, yeah, or on a par with Pele or something, right? He was just absolutely fabulous. But um, yeah. Anyway, and because he played for Northern Ireland, he never got the international uh, credit uh, credit that was due to him. Fabulous. So look him up, Google him, George Best. Anyway. Anyway, the, the, you, you talked about what happened in childhood with, you, you know, what you used to see and what your brother and your parents would say. And then you talked about not doing anything with it and then meditating and meditating. And then you talked about like how you have access to a whole other levels of information or worlds or something. And just on the, the way that the way that I think of it, 
is bc flowers in ultraviolet i don't so the bees have access to a, a, a information about the world that i don't have yeah maybe i could develop ultraviolet vision unlikely right <laughs> but then that would give me access to a whole other level of information so what you're saying i understand is you developed a a way of accessing this whole other level of information that's outside of normal everyday awareness. Because, you know, I'm just, how am I going to feed the family and pay them more? That's right. You know, make sure I look fairly presentable and I need a haircut later on today, right? All that sort of stuff. And then also how information comes to you and where it comes from. Okay, so let's so let's go to, to childhood. So these people that were talking to you, or these spirits, who are the, and then I want to go into the, next levels that you were talking about right okay what did you talk to them about were you frightened where did they come from who are they are they human beings what are they when i when i used to talk to them they used to say to me that they lived on the earth and that they lived a life on the earth and then they when they they passed over their physical body was but an overcoat so they were they were like the that um, they took off the overcoat and they then became aware of another realm, which was what they told me was the astral world. So this other realm, it, when it was explained to me, it's rather or how I can explain it to you is that when you see everything around you now, everything is solid. <clears throat> everything seems solid. And yet science tells us it's not solid. No. Science tells us that it's a mass of moving electrons, protons, neutrons, and atoms. Now, the interesting thing is, the reason that we all see each other and this world is solid is because everything in this world vibrates at a certain frequency. I don't know, say so many hundred thousand hertz per second. So because it all vibrates at the same frequency, we are the same. So it becomes solid. Now, when we actually pass over and we die, we then reside in this space again in a body, but it's maybe 50,000 hertz per second more than this realm. So this realm becomes invisible, and this the other realm, or the astral realm, which vibrates at that frequency, becomes visible. And so it's very interesting because part of the experience of this meditation technique I was using was I realized the astral world. I, I accessed it. And it was scary, frightening, but exhilarating as well. So this meditation I was doing every day. And then what I was finding was I was laying in bed, and I was feeling very floaty floaty or trying to go to sleep and I was feeling very floaty and I would wake up and I would be on the on the ceiling I would be this a spirit on the ceiling looking down at my body on the bed and I just couldn't believe this and I could not get off the ceiling and I would push on the ceiling and I would come down slightly and then I'd go back up again and I just could not get off the ceiling I did not have the knowledge of I found myself in this astral body now, this body I found myself in was the body you go into at death. I could see my physical body on the, on the, uh, on the bed. So this was a fascinating thing what took place. I was actually living in a house where I was wanting a lodger. And this chap turned up. And this is why I don't believe anything happens by chance. I think everything's all part of a greater plan. He came in, <clears throat> this chap. You know when you get that gut feeling, I don't like you? I had it. And he wanted to rent this room off me. So I had this feeling and he came in and he said, um, I've got a cat. I thought, well, he's definitely not coming in because I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> I'm allergic to cats, you see. So I thought he's definitely not coming in. And then he tells me he's a lead guitarist in a band. I thought that's two reasons why he's not coming in. OK. When he looked at the room, he looked at me. And he said, I'll take it. And I thought, I know you. And. I let him take the room and I couldn't believe it. He gave me the deposit and he's got to take the room. The first night I was off to look to the pub, he had a window that I could look through as I walked down the hallway. And as I looked in, I saw him sat in a chair with his thing, his, his legs crossed and his hands in, the, in, in a, mudra, a mudra state, looking at a candle. I thought, he's a meditator. He's a meditator. So next morning I spoke to him. He had far more knowledge than I did. And I asked him about the astral projection i was experiencing and he said yes i've done that many times he said this is what you have to do when you find yourself on the ceiling i said what what do i need to do he said bring your whole attention and your consciousness to this part your third eye and at that point with your focus will yourself and say stand so it wasn't long 
before I'm on the ceiling again. It wasn't long. And when I'm up there, I'm thinking, I remembered what he said. Sean, his name was. I remember what Sean said. So I brought my attention to here and I went, with all my, my will, stand. And I came off the ceiling and I was standing by my, my body on the bed. And I was ecstatic. And the interesting thing was, this body I was in, it was a body of light. It was lighting up the dark room because there was no light on the room. But you could see everything from this body of light that I was standing in. And the interesting thing was, I thought, I'm out. I want to go downstairs. So I thought it must be the same principle. So I focused my mind here on the third eye. And I thought, downstairs. And as I did, it was like a whoosh. And I was, I, I, my feet didn't touch the stairs, nothing. I was in the chair downstairs. The interesting thing for me was what I saw when I was out. What interested me was, when I looked at the walls, ceiling, and the floor, it was all emanate, em, emanating colour. It was all emanating colour, and it was all moving. It was like shimmering. It wasn't solid. Because I was in this state, I could see how it wasn't solid. Because my vibrational rate had increased and was not the same as that. If it had been the same, it would seem solid. Okay. No, no, that's fascinating. And I can get it. Because in quantum physics and also in other philosophies like Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism, what we think is solid, like the wall behind you, me, it's just concentrated energy, different concentrations of energy, or as you might put it, as you understand it, and new to me, I've heard it before, right? By different vibrations, but I suppose that would produce different concentrations. Because all I am is a series of molecules, but they're just closer packed together. And there's no end to, there's no point here where I end or anything, because it's all molecules all the way through, right? Absolutely. Because I can get that. So what's the kind of meditation that you did? That, okay. uh, actually, sorry, before that, before that, sorry, Stephen, something else, right? I've had that experience of the walls moving and stuff, but it was aided by hallucinogenic mushrooms. You know, <laughs> when I took magic mushrooms. So then, so, that, so then I thought, like, and this is when I was at university, I was much younger, and I thought, I was like, that's what it is. You're just tripping. You're just tripping. You're, you're, you're off your head on something. So I don't know it's real. Okay, let me tell you. So, because you're fully, when, the, when you're in the astral form, you're fully conscious. Okay, when you do, when people do mushrooms or drugs or they've done drugs and things, <clears throat> and this is what my teacher, I want to talk to you about my teacher who I met uh, later. Um, what he said to me was, he said, that the drugs will alter your consciousness. So it will have an effect on your brain. It will have an effect on serotonin. It will have an effect. And it will actually affect your brain waves. And what will happen is you will perceive things, um, but the thing is you're not in control of it. So these people that have taken drugs, a lot of musicians and things like this have taken them, they're not in control of this. They're literally on a trip, as you said, which they're not in control of. And they end up then having to just wait for the effects of the drug to wear off. And to be honest, it's actually, um, you know, it can be used. I mean, they've done experiments what they did in California with LSD, where, you know, some of the greatest inventions uh, that we've had, especially to do with Silicon Valley and electronics, have come from people to LSD because they accessed, they accessed different realms of consciousness where they received information of how to make certain um, electronics. So there was benefits, but there's one problem with this. There's just a problem is that if you're not ready, it's rather like having the infrastructure in place. If you haven't got your infrastructure in place or your wiring isn't strong enough, and then you access yourself to that level of consciousness or energy, you can burn out or you can destroy uh, your mental faculty. And this is why a lot of people, you know, who did drugs, they're not really quite the same again. Sure. But this through meditation, you can actually build your infrastructure, you build strong wiring so that when that power does come, that, that energy, I mean, you're ready for it. And it doesn't destroy you, it doesn't burn you, it doesn't to have a negative effect, it has a positive effect. But I will make you laugh, though. Um, when you're starting to meditate, one of the things you start seeing is colors. You'll start seeing the vibrations of colors. But the one you'll see mostly is purple. Purple is, is very much connected to here. And you, you'll see this, this color, this is what... Have you noticed what a lot of the musicians used to write about? <laughs> Prince Purple Rain. <laughs> purple Rain. That's right. And even, even the band Deep Purple. Yes, 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 that's yes, where yes. That's, that, that's where it's come from. 
Can you say? That's amazing. Now, I think uh, there is something different. I've never taken ayahuasca, but I, I've heard there's something, and I don't want this to be about hallucinogenic drugs, something, and I've never taken LSD or any of the synthetic substances. There's a difference, say, between psilocybin, magic mushrooms, and ayahuasca, and then things like heroin and cocaine and maybe yeah. LSD. Um, <sighs> but the, the, I just want to share a little story about LSD and Kerry Mullis, the guy that invented the PCR test. Yeah. Apparently that it was on an LSD trip that he, he traveled into the molecular realm and saw how he could invent, how he could work out to measure these tiny, tiny amounts of substances, which which then he later developed into the PCR test. Like, what? That's right. <laughs> but I get but, what but, you're saying about uh, meditation, that I'm at the source of it, because I'm, I'm not at, then at the effect of how much psilocybin or mescaline is going through my head or my bloodstream or whatever. So then I get to be at the source of it. So what's this kind of meditation that you do? And is it something okay, well, that you can learn? Can people do you uh, well, it? It's, yeah, it's it's training the mind in a certain way. But let me just say to you, just before I go into that, all the great inventors all use mind experiments. Yes. And even Steve Jobs of Apple, he he received information about the, the um, his uh, the electronics there when he was meditating in California. Um, interestingly, and one of the people he used to follow was a guru called Yogananda, who was a deep meditator. Um, Einstein called it his thought experiments. Yes. He called it his thought experiments. So anyway, so the meditation technique is, so I've actually, I've done a course, <clears throat> I've done two courses, a beginners and an advanced, the, the initial course, two and a half hours. And it teaches a basic technique of working with one-pointedness with the mind. Now, the purpose of a one-pointedness is where you focus your mind in a particular point and you keep it busy. But what you're keeping busy, you're keeping the ego busy the personality, the part of our mind is always active, always wants to know this, wants to know that, ins and outs, and it's never, it's never quiet. Uh, it's, it's, chattering, never, it's chattering away yeah. right now, saying it's chattering away. That's I'm right. You. Yeah. It is. But with this particular technique, after a period, you can actually learn to control that. And when you control it, what happens is you then start to become aware that you're far more. You thought you were just the little personality, the aspect that went about its day-to-day work. But once you've given that aspect something to do and it's disciplined, what happens is you start to become aware that you're far more. And so your consciousness starts to, over a period of time, connect or recognize that you are this infinite being rather than this finite being. And it's interesting, the person said, how does it work? I said, right, so the technique is rather like you bring your mind back to that one-pointedness with whatever it is you're focusing on. And in my uh, video meditation is to do with the candle flame. You keep bringing it back. You keep bringing your mind back. Every time the ego takes you off on a journey, what should I do? Or have for tea? Or I'll have a beer tonight? Or should I watch TV? You, you bring it back to the candle. You bring it back to the candle. And the interesting thing is, it's a battle to start with. It's like dealing with a naughty child. Do you know that series on television with the, the nanny? Do you know when the nanny comes in and tries to sort out the badly behaved child? I love that. This, this nanny came in this particular day with these parents. I think the parents are more at fault. Anyway, so you she came in <laughs> and uh, she said, please let me deal with your, your son. There's only a little boy. And, they said, and she said, what's the problem with him? He will not go to bed. He will not stay in his bed. She said, okay, leave it to me. I will deal with that. So what happened was the nanny put him to bed. Within minutes, he's out. She did not become upset, unhappy, uptight. She took him back to bed. And she did this 33 times the first night without becoming angry or upset, nothing, didn't say anything, just kept taking him back to bed. The next night, I think it was about 24. The next night, it was 10, 5, 2, 1, none. None. He never got out of bed once. No, no more. No more. As the week went by, no more. Now, I use that analogy. Is that the nanny is the expanded part of our consciousness, the greater part. And the naughty child within us is the ego that won't stay in bed, won't stay focused on the candle. So what you do, you keep taking him back to the candle. You keep taking the ego back to the candle, back to the candle. So like taking the naughty child back to bed, back to bed, not becoming angry or upset. And eventually, the ego does what you want it to do. Really? Then you start to become aware of your, your, your potential. 
And my God, the potential a human mind has is incredible, is infinite. We are so limited in how we are, how we think. And what we do with that limited thought that we have, we create a world around us of suffering because of a belief system of not knowing who we are. So these, te these techniques I teach will create changes. It will develop you psychically. And it will create contentment, happiness, ease, confidence. Because you're not this fearful little being anymore. Because yes. you start to recognize who you are and what your potential is. Yes. And you know the key, the interesting thing is this is the wonderful thing. When you start to gain this knowledge, you actually get to the point. The greatest power you can ever have is to want no power. When you want something, you'll have a bit of something, but you won't have everything. All the time you want a bit of something, you won't have everything. Yeah. And, it's, and so the key ultimately is through meditation, recognizing you're not what this ego tells you you are. It takes a little time. The penny drops. The freedom is the result. And there's a, there a contentment, a peace that can come that, is beyond anything I could really explain to you. But every, t every now and then I have this, and it's priceless. Yes. Priceless. Sounds, it's, it's fascinating. I'm completely fascinated. So I want to say a few things. Yeah. So I remember reading a book called The Heart of the World many, many years ago, I think in the late 90s or something, and it was about the Kogi people in South America who lived on this mountaintop, and they didn't have electricity, didn't have newspapers or radios. They lived as they'd always lived, as farmers and stuff in a very spiritual life they meditate for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours every moment of their day is an act of worship the way that they live and they invited the bbc over and they were able to tell these hard-boiled journalists what was happening in india because of yogis that they'd met in the spirit world and i'm reading this book and i'm like my god what 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 how do you convince a hard-boiled journalist and they're saying oh yeah this is happening in india this is happening they've got no access to media or anything like that no. So, no, so go on. It's fast. It's fascinating, but but that that is a truth. It's not. It sounds fantasy, but it's actually a truth. You know, if you look at the Aborigines, they could um, they could be out in the outback, and they could then go and find water by going into the astral body, going into the spirit realm, and find and then being directed to where the water was. Yes. You know, this is like in tribes and and tribes people. This is just was a natural thing, and then apparently we became civilized. Well, well yeah, know? well, then Descartes came and ruined everything because he Absolutely. said, if you, can't, if you can't count it, if you can't divide it, it ain't worth nothing. So he created a division between mind and body, which has given rise to Western thought. Now, now, I just want to share another story. I don't know if you know about Cambo. No. Cam Cambo is a native South American form of treatment. Uh, and what, you, what happened was, the story goes, is that a whole bunch of people in this village were ill. and and um, the shaman, he took some ayahuasca. And as he was taking the ayahuasca, of course, what happened was the plants told him what he needed to do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's what That's happened. Right. Right? <laughs> yeah. So Now, the plants told him that he had to go and get this the, the toxin from the cambo frog. You may have seen pictures of the bright green luminous yeah. green frogs, right? Now, they're luminous because they're so poisonous. Jaguars, That's nothing right. will eat them. Right, you eat them, you're dead. You'll kill jaguars, yeah. right? But yeah. apparently, what they what the plants told him to do was to scrape the toxin off the skin. Do, and I, by the way, I've had cambo treatment, right? To uh, burn a hole, a superficial hole in the skin, and then apply the toxin there. Then it's not poisonous, and then it goes wow. into the lymphatic system, <laughs> and it's really great for the for the for your health holistically, mentally, emotionally, physically, everything. So he did this on, as the plants guided him. And the story goes, the whole village recovered. So Unbelievable. <laughs> what? What? But, but it's interesting. Where do you think all the knowledge came from with all the herbs? You know, was it just trial and error? Um, or was it actually with the shaman? Uh, and they communicated with, with these, um, uh, maybe the inner beings of inner planes that guided them. Yes. gave them that particular information because if you look at it there is a plant for every ailment i mean uh, the big farmer uh, <laughs> big farmer are uh, in uh, the amazon rainforest talking to to shaman 
and they are. But they're obviously that they're looking for maybe more of a monetary gain potentially. Yeah. But there's one problem: is what they tend to do is they they tend to take one substance out of mm. that particular plant rather than using holistically the whole plant. Yes, which is probably That's, more more beneficial. You know, absolutely. but all. I think of it as a difference, say, between I don't know, getting a synthetic vitamin A versus organic raw egg yolk, the natural, yeah. holistic, um, multivitamin. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now, this meditation, are courses available if somebody wanted to learn? Could they contact you? And then Yes, it's actually, um, my, my website is Think Right, Be Right. And um, so if you actually go into Think Right, Be Right, uh, then all the details are there, and you can actually purchase the. Um, we've got the um, the beginners, and then we've got the advanced that's just going up any time now. Um, and I do suggest really that a person does the beginners really, just because it helps to build the infrastructure. I said, sure, it sure, starts sure. to get the body ready for the energy that is going to start to manifest. That's why interesting when you look at yoga, yoga is the wheel; it's holistic. But yoga, or the whole purpose of certain yogas was to, you go through different different yogas to gain enlightenment. Hatha yoga, for instance, which is connected to uh, strengthening the body. The whole purpose of the strengthening of the body is to prepare yourself for the energy that comes when you meditate. Wow. Okay. Okay. And, and, and there with Hatha yoga, actually yoga, we're talking about a form of a practice that's been done by human beings for thousands and thousands of years thousands of which years. really i don't do it by the way i find it too bendy but i just never <laughs> got into it but i completely get the validity of it okay so i'll have the think right be right i'll have the links to that in the description below and i do invite people to check Fantastic. it out Is it done online or in person if somebody in the u.s wanted to do it yeah so the, so this is a video course a two and a half hour video course and you'll see a lot of me teaching you step by step by step and um yeah, just think right, be right, and you'll you'll go straight through. Great. Okay. Then then so you've you've trained yourself in meditation. You you can now access the astral plane. You can now get yourself off the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but and you then know push the, it out the place. <laughs> but but you know the interesting thing is when you can do it, you then don't feel the need to do it. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know So it's 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 an experience that you have. Um, and the interesting thing with when you talked about these shaman and people, like my teacher, <clears throat> um, he would work with a group where they would, at a certain time, they would sit in meditation, they would leave their body, each of them, maybe they were different parts of the country or world, and they would all meet up as a group in the astral world. And they would work on behalf of what he used to say to me was the White Brotherhood. And I said, what is the White Brotherhood then? He said, well, it's for the evolution of mankind to help with the process of, of mankind. Well, I used to think, well, but he used to. And I remember just before he died, just before he died, he was going to do this with me because he knew I could come out. So we were going to sit together and then he was going to, we were going to both come out of body and then he was going to take me into the inner astral world, um, which I was excited but terrified um, at the time. And um, and unfortunately, he, um, he he did pass. He did say to me, he didn't have long. He said, I haven't got long, so we have to. So every Saturday, I used to go and have training by him um, uh, for most of the day. And uh, and then, but he didn't have long, which was a shame. You know, an amazing person. Okay, an amazing person. And, and but and the I'm, interest you're carrying on his legacy. Letting well, the interesting thing is. <clears throat> His, he was trained by uh, a famous uh, occultist um, called uh, W.E. Butler, and um, <clears throat> who was a famous occultist um, who took over, and, and then who took over from um, him was Delores Ashcroft and Orwicky, and they were very much a group called the Servants of the Light. And these were mystics. These were people who worked with real magic. Now, ever since I was a child, I knew intuitively that there was real magic. I'm not talking about Darren Brown, Paul Daniels, trickery. I'm talking about the manipulation of the elements. And, and I've seen things. <laughs> I've seen things and experienced things 
uh, which make reality look a little bit silly. For example, and could you share one? One of the experiences, I would say, one of the experiences I would say to you, okay, so once with my teacher, <clears throat> The lodger that I spoke about earlier, who I didn't like, who ended up being a meditator, happened to be the one who introduced me to my teacher, which was incredible, all part of a plan, I think, somewhere along the line. Anyway, <clears throat> as I got to know him, John, I used to call him Yogi John, and as I got to know him, he would, um, I remember him saying, I, I asked him once, this was years ago, um, would he train me? And he said, no, he wouldn't. Uh, I wasn't ready. Well, I was most upset, to be honest, most. Um, and it was then 10 years before he then said he would, 10 years later. And then I didn't have a great deal of time with him. But in that time, he showed me things. And this particular day sticks in my mind, was where I got to his house and Sean was with me, my friend. We were sat and he said, Stephen, you can feel objects, can't you? And you can gain information from them. And I said, yeah. So this, what I'm talking to you about now, is, is a psychic uh, ability called psychometry. So, for instance, if I took your ring off your hand, I could hold it and allow my mind, and I could be able to tell you intricate details of your life, you, your family, your health, everything from the vibration of that ring. It's like a book. And there are certain people that are good at it. Um, I would say I'm not bad, but it's not one of my strongest points, to be honest, okay? But I've seen it demonstrated many times, and it's so good. So anyway, he said this, you can do this. I said, yeah. So I was expecting him, I was expecting him to just put an object in my hand, like something. So, he, But he left the room, he went off, and as he came back, he had something in his hand. And he said, um, Stephen, he said, close your eyes a minute. I said, okay. So <laughs> I closed my eyes, I put my hand out. But I wasn't expecting what was going to happen. When he placed this object in my hand, <clears throat> well, the intensity of the energy was so overwhelming, I thought my heart <clears throat> was going to leave my chest. I couldn't see anything but white, bright white light. And it was incredible. The, the, the power in this hand, and, this, and it was a ring in my hand, was so intense. I didn't know if I could hold it. I didn't know if I could cope holding it. I wanted to put it down because it was so, the pressure within me was so overwhelming. And as I could just start to breathe and I opened my eyes, I looked at him and I just was trying to talk. I went, what is this? And he went, hmm, interesting, Stephen. He said, I thought you could just about hold it. I said, what is this? And he said, it's a power ring. And I looked at Sean at the side. I said, have you, has, he, have you, has he ever let you hold this? He said, no, never. And I'm trying to hold on to this, and I don't want to hold on to it because it's too much. And I said to him, so what is this? And he said, I use it. He said, so when I meditate and I go very high, I said, what do you mean high? He said, when I go to heaven, I charge the ring with heavenly light. And then when I return of the meditation, I hide the ring. He said, and if I have a need of any time of, of, of maybe a tool or a prop to help me, so I'll just go and put the ring on, and I'm immediately in a heightened state of consciousness. He's not joking. It was, it's, um, it was frightening. And I said to him, you hide this. And, and I'm, I'm still trying to hold it. And he said, yes. And I said, why do you hide it? He said, well, you don't let anybody just touch that. It's dangerous. And I said, huh, hold on a minute. You, <laughs> you're telling me that this is dangerous, I said, but you just put it in my hand. And he said, yes, but I thought, he said, all the work you've done, he said, I thought you could just about hold it energetically. And I said, so let me just get this right. I said, so you hide it in the drawer. Say a cleaner came in and was going through things and touched it. What would happen? He went, oh, let's hope that doesn't happen. And I said, okay, I understand. Let's hope it doesn't happen. But what would happen if they did? And he said, the ring would physically burn their skin. Wow. I said, it would and I thought, oh, my God. I left. I left that house. On absolute cloud nine, he asked me, please do not tell anybody. Please do not tell anybody. Lord of the Rings. This was Lord of the Rings. So I was thinking. Okay. This, this yeah. was Lord of the Rings. So he said, ask me not to tell anybody, of course. How can you not tell anybody? So I went straight home and told my wife. <laughs> She's your okay. wife. She then immediately, she said, I've got to see this ring. 
And I said, Nicola, you do not want to touch this wing. You do not want to touch it. And I was fearful for her. So anyway, do you know what she did? She phoned him up, Yogi John, and invited him round for dinner, right? But asked him to bring the ring. I couldn't believe it. I was, I, I was embarrassed. I was because I wasn't supposed to talk about it. So now I've got Yogi John, as I called him, coming round for dinner. He's going to have the ring on. Now the thing that got me was when he turned up, he was wearing it. I just don't know how he could for that length of time. But I was just for minutes, and it was overpowering but you can imagine where what level of consciousness he was at it was he was wearing it with ease so i looked at it and i thought oh god please don't let nicola touch this anyway so he what he did was he then showed her uh, no nicola said oh is that the ring john and he said yes and he put it on his little finger and he pushed it over towards her and he said do not touch and i went oh thank god for that so all, all night we were we were having having dinner and he kept that ring on. Believe me when I tell you, I've seen him, I've seen many other things that, that are incredible with this man. And he was a real yogi. He was a Merlin. He was a Merlin, a yogi. And there was supernatural power. And he did things and he showed me things and how he could move objects with his mind. And he, it took him 10 years before he told me how he could do certain things. 10 years. So I now know how he could do those things. Interesting, isn't it? It is. It's it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I'm open to it. You know, I'm of the opinion there's so much that I don't know. There's so much I can't see. There's so much to be discovered, you know, for both of us. Yeah. It's not like we've reached the apogee of knowledge and stuff, right? But but you know, I can imagine some of my friends and family watching this and thinking, what is this hocus pocus nonsense claptrap? What has happened to crypto rich? He's gone off the Bitcoin was gone. <laughs> What do you mean? I mean, trying to explain Bitcoin to my father, right? <laughs> what, what, what? Or trying to explain internet banking to my father, right? Never mind Bitcoin, right? Like, what is this? This is a whole other realm. What are you talking about? Right? No, 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 no. This is real. This is real. Don't worry about that hocus pocus, claptrap nonsense or whatever. So what do you say to naysayers? You see, this is the difficulty, you see, and I, <clears throat> I very rarely talk about the, what, this, what the experiences I had. But I always knew, you see, isn't it interesting, okay? We accept, without, you know, you talk to people, we accept that we have a star called the sun and we are a planet called the earth that revolves around the sun and we're in a, an infinite universe where there is no uh, beginning or end. Um, you know, but we accept all that. <laughs> that's okay. Actually, that's very good. We accept that myth as truth. As okay. That's Yeah, that's normal. You know, because that's what we accept. That's normal because that's what you see, what you perceive. Once you've had different experiences. So, so, sorry, uh, Stephen, it's not even what we perceive. It's a myth that then shapes how we perceive it. Yes. Yes. And, but we just think it's true. It may be true. I don't know. I don't have experience but, of whizzing around the sun. I don't feel well, it. Well, you see, we're programmed from when we're young. Yeah. So from when we're a baby, we're told everything we're not new beings we're just we're just replicas of other people because everything that everybody else believes we we then believe ultimately because we're, we're learning you know we're told as a child that's grass and that's green or that's a tree that's separate from the grass and that's this that uh, you know we're told all these different things and it just becomes part of our our normality of what we believe to be true mm. but this leads me on really to you're talking about currency you're talking about wealth you're talking about money and 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 creating you know a good lifestyle for yourself and things like this. Now, if you use the mind in the correct way, you could be wealthy. And when you use the mind in the correct way, you will then automatically draw wealth to you, and you will be wealthy. If you use the mind in the wrong way, uh, you will be poor. You won't be drawn to opportunity. You won't meet people, apparently, accidentally, that will assist or open doors for you. If you use the mind in the correct way, you can have anything you wish, materially. You'll be drawn to uh, a share on the stock exchange. You'll be drawn to um, buying cryptocurrency or a particular type of cryptocurrency, all by using the mind and in a particular way. And, 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 and the access to that particular way will be meditating and the power of intention, being interesting. open. The way to actually is to decide 
what you think that you're worth. Whatever you think you're worth, you'll have. Because what happens is this consciousness, actually, you invoke through the law of cause and effect. So the universe will give you what you think you are or what you think that you deserve. It doesn't judge. It's neutral. It just waits for guidelines, which come from our belief system. It's very interesting. Excuse me for interrupting you, Stephen, because I've just recently done a course by Joe Dispenza, and it, it's very similar. I mean, I can hear a lot of overlaps with what you're talking about, because he says your personality gives rise to your per personal reality, which makes Absolutely. sense to me, because you know I deal with um, people that are damaged, dysfunctional, have all sorts of trauma, and then their yeah. life is a reflection of that. <clears throat> It matches. Yes. And, and the biggest problem is with people who have had trauma is that they keep going back into memory. Mm. And when you go back into memory, you become memory. And then what happens is, if you're not careful, you bring forward, if you've been a victim in a certain situation or something that's happened, which is terrible or traumatic, what we want to really try and do is leave it because we want to leave that place and be in the moment, in the now that's where then we're free to be someone new, to, to invoke or attract positive things in our life in the moment, in the now. But what people tend to do is they go back into memory of being the victim and they bring the victim into the moment. And so they're continually living a life of the victim and the suffering continues. So all these things can be helped through learning to understand the mind we then can uh, eradicate suffering, well, not totally, but, you know, a lot of it. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I like to listen to the Dalai Lama sometimes and um, because he's, he's a wonderful guy and he, and he laughs a lot and he's compassionate. And, um, but he said something really interesting. I went to see him in, in Glasgow. We flew to Glasgow to see him, and it wasn't just me and him having a cup of tea. There was about 1,000 people there, about 1,000 people there. And it was really interesting because, um, what he said was, and this threw everybody, he said, do you want a happy life? And we all nodded. Yeah, that'd be lovely. And he said, be selfish then. We all looked and we thought, hold on, the Dalai Lama is saying, do you, if you want a happy life, you've got to be selfish. And we looked at him and he laughed and he said, your selfishness, is this how you need to be selfish? He said, give, 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 give. And what he was saying, of course, is you're being selfish because the more you give, you know, the more you will come back to you tenfold. Mm. Can you see? When you give, it comes back in how you give. This is the interesting thing with consciousness is the ego or the small part of the ego, which is what we're trying to gain control over, is full of fear. It's selfish, self-centered, and it really just wants to survive and it lives in fear. It's what Jung says, or Freud said, is the id within our ego. It's the id. It's the survival instinct. It's got to look after number one, me first. Trouble is with that, you suffer because of that. So when we start, and we, what we do is we give less. So if we give less, as the Dalit Lama says, you get less. You give less because you're fearful of giving because you, is there going to be enough for me? So you've then said to the universe, I don't know if there's going to be enough for me. The universe says, I can't give you much then. Right. And then and then in that, I'm keeping myself small and limited and constrained. It's very good. I, it's just something on that, Stephen, that's opened up for me in the last few weeks or so is because I do help out my friends and family with crypto. And I have recently done a couple of seminars for friends and family for free where I train them how to use a particular cryptocurrency that's been very successful, particular project, which has been very successful for me. And everybody's watching it, the Cosmos ecosystem. Um, yeah. And I just I just trained them and showed them how to do it and don't invest more than you can afford to lose. And some of the they have less money. I help them out and throw them some crypto and stuff. And I'm finding I, I find that incredibly rewarding because there's no point in me being affluent and comfortable and having an easy life and my children being taken care of if my friends and family don't have that. I can't be That's happy. Right. I don't know if it was Malcolm X or Martin Luther King who said something like that. How can how can a man be happy when when there is uh, when there is suffering around him? Absolutely. And I, I understand what you said totally, because what you're saying is, if you look at the two states, the little self, which is the ego, just looks after number one, only interested in number one. But the more you give, the more that you actually come into that level of consciousness, 
you actually start to regard the human race as your family. Mm. You start to look, at, and you, when we start to go into that level of consciousness, it becomes one a more beautiful world because we're sharing. We're not living in fear. And the other thing is, when you're giving to these people with the cryptocurrency and things like this, or your family, when you're doing that, giving it free, uh, your free time, you know, you're not charging for this. What you're doing is saying to the universe, you're saying, I want to give and I'm going to give my time and I'm going to serve others. And I'm going to give my time. I don't want money for it. So what you're saying to the universe is, I'm giving it freely because I have the abundance and I'm so lucky. I've got a wonderful life. The universe then says, oh, he's got the abundance. We'll give him a bit more. And he's got a wonderful life. We'll allow him to continue everything going according to plan. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, the, the universe bit logic is new to me, right? But okay, okay, I'm not going to dismiss it, right? But also, that's how it works. I, I get it, I get it, I get it. It's, you know, it's, this is a new realm for me. But also, like, I suppose my social work, you know, I'm very, very blessed. I'm happily married. My kids are doing really well. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm middle class, I'm comfortable, I'm affluent, things are handled. I, I'm a, you know, I'm a graduate. And, you know, I see doing the social work that I do in really, really run down estates with people that I think are the most disenfranchised of all, the abused children from dysfunctional households. It's like, you know, that's that's a um, it's a labor of love. It's an act. It's bloody hard and unpleasant. It's really hard and unpleasant. I can imagine. I'm just dealing with upset people doing upset things and upsetting more and more, right? But I just, yeah. I do see it is a labor of love and I do see it like as God's work. And I do get to contribute and make a difference from who I'm being with them and out of respect for them. Uh, so, so that also ties in. And just, I, I, I want to ask you a question in a moment. Before I do that, one of the things that I'm going to be doing, and I want to let people know this, in a few weeks' time, I'm actually I'm going to do these seminars for free for members of the public, for viewers. All I'll ask is that you subscribe to my channel, follow me on Twitter, join my Telegram announcements channel and just support my work that way. And I'm going to throw open my Zoom, set it up, advertise it through my videos. People can come and attend, ask questions, and I'll share with them in a live interaction what I'm learning, what I'm doing. And I'm also going to be doing that with particular cryptocurrency projects that I'm following as well. So I want to let people know. It's not like you said, it's not just about my friends and family. Okay, I'm taking care of them. Let me take care of others and then support them to take care of those that are important to them. That's right. But all the time, it's service, you see. You're giving. It's service. And that is the higher mind, as I call it. And the more the more that you're in that higher mind, the happier, more contented you're going to be. And that is the more. And then that will attract more affluence. But you're giving. But I'm giving. not doing it for the affluence. That's the paradox. No. And that's the key. The, the more that we give because it's the, the, it's the love of giving, <laughs> the crazy thing is the greater the affluence that comes back. Yes. It's, that's, the, that's the crazy thing. When that's, you were talking about crazy. people. Even, sorry, it's not the love of giving. It's love. Love of people, love for people. It's love. I just wanted to qualify a little bit further. That's how it seems to me. But it is a, a joyful act to contribute to another. Yes. But carry on, please. Well, if you look at what love is, love is not no separation love actually is not being separate from anyone or anything that's why um but the opposite of love is is very much self is ego separation just looking after myself love is looking after every person every being you come into contact with it's not being it's actually love is non-dualistic mm. so if i can explain that non-dualism just quickly you know when you people have been in love or they've fallen in love with somebody and they can't eat, they can't talk, they can't, you know, they, they just dwell up and look at their partner and they, you know, they could do no wrong. What's actually happened is, it's really quite interesting, and the sad thing is, they call it the honeymoon period, don't they? But the sad thing is, is, is but when they do this, for a moment, they are in ecstasy for a short period, love. They are in love deeply with their partner. And what's actually happened is, they are no longer separate from their partner. Mm. Them themselves and their partner are one so what's happened is as far as consciousness is concerned the person who loves the other person is actually in his source he's in his 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 natural state he's he's in his higher total higher being and there is no separation and he loves and adores that he thinks more of the other person than he does himself there is not two there is just oneness but there's one problem that takes place then they can't sustain that power that energy that love 
its intensity. It's the nearest you'll come to knowing enlightenment before you're enlightened. Yes. And then what happens is, and what happens is you look at the partner, and as time goes on, <clears throat> you detach. You no longer are one, you start to see them as separate than yourself. And what happens is in the separation, you notice the little things that annoy you. Mm. Then in that separation, you notice you're comparing, comparison has come in. Now you're in comparison where you feel inferior or superior. Now you've got conflict. That's what happens. So that is duality, but non-duality is love. And that ultimately is what I, my main teaching is ultimately through meditation, is to step by step by step, bringing your consciousness into non-dualism, to be one with all things and all beings. You've seen some of these, these masters, these spiritual teachers, they beam from ear to ear. They're just in this incredible state, whoever they come into contact with, because they love everybody. They're in that, that state. Mm. Can you imagine? So, you know? so, yeah, so, so what is it? Because we're recording this on the 22nd of February, and last night the Canadian government extended the Emergency Act, and there's how Justin Trudeau has been talking about a certain group of people in a particular way. You know, that was one of the things he said that I, it, it's, I think it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous and amusing at the same and absurd, right? Because he's, you know, the Freedom Convoy, the truckers, white supremacists, right wing, yeah. racist Nazis, for ignoring that a significant proportion of the truckers in Canada are Sikhs. So he's including them as, as white supremacists, racist Nazis, and stuff. But where, where you get people doing nasty things like that to other human beings, what's going on with them if they've forgotten who they are? Are they not in touch with, are they just stuck in duality? Uh, jet, stuck in duality, definitely. But what's happened is, is that <clears throat> um, they're very dualistic. But what is, if you look at where there is the most separation, there's the most fear. You see, even if you look at, you know, our world at the moment, look what's going on in the Ukraine. <clears throat> We've got, we're not operating as a world. We still identify ourselves as, we come from a particular country. Right. We, we are British, we're Irish, we're Scottish, we're whatever that is. <clears throat> so we're still clansmen, if you like. We're still identifying with um, tribalism at some level. And we need to, firstly, we need to collectively come together and work as a world. So the world works as a collective whole. So then that reduces fear because we're no longer, you're this, I'm that. The comparison then is, is uh, uh, eradicated. Yeah. Which and is what happens, but then what happens is, Rich, is that things like what you're seeing in Canada and really the misuse of power, the misuse of power comes from fear. So let's have a look at even with the, the vaccinations and things of that particular nature is that everybody should have the free choice to decide what they do now but that's not that's been taken away there's there's been lots of problems with that where there's been um you, you know people with different viewpoints and not even allowed time on the media mm. because so what's happened is the greater the the, the club that has that you are attributed to or you're connected to maybe if you're part of the vaccinated you know it's become tribal you, the comparison is set, and you've set again separation, and this is what causes fear. You're not one of us. You could be a danger to us. Right. This just creates conflict, war, and it has done for, for hundreds of years. We and, have and to. I can get it's fear based. You know those totally. that want the mandates or whatever. You know, <clears throat> it's, okay, it's your body. I get to put. I get to say what goes in your body because I'm afraid what it might happen to me otherwise. So it's all, I get it. It's all out of fear, right? But, and, yeah. and, it, and it ties in with the stuff I've read because I've been very interested in anthropology in my time, how hunter-gatherers, pre-industrial societies, pre-monotheistic religions just see the world as one. The trees as one, the one with the trees, the, sky, the stars, the sky, the earth, the animals, just all as one. Yes. Which again brings us back to Descartes and how he messed things up for us with his um, paradigm shift that he caused. Now, but, but just on that, what about religion? You know, I'm Muslim. <clears throat> How does that yeah. tie in with all of this? Because, you know, Muslims don't have reincarnation, but there is a meditative tradition within Islam, Sufism. I think there's a meditative tradition in Judaism and also in Christianity. So how does that intersect with this form of knowledge that you're talking about? Oh. Uh, you see, <clears throat> again, if you look at religions, 
they've been generally changed or manipulated as time's gone on by who? By man. <clears throat> but the essence of all religion is uh, non-dualism, unity. Yeah. It but it's been, it's been manipulated. And <clears throat> if you look at reincarnation, it's a very interesting one because <clears throat> if you go back far enough, reincarnation was accepted as a truth in literally all the religions <clears throat> if you go back far enough. And did you know that, for instance, um, <clears throat> Christianity believed at one time in um, reincarnation? It was there. And it was changed at the time of Constantine, I believe. I, I think I'm right. Constantine under Empress Theodora. They didn't like the idea of that. They wanted more control. It's either heaven or hell. You behave yourself, it's heaven. If you don't, it's hell. You can't come back and do it again. And, but, that was at, but the interesting thing is, Christian scholars will know this. They will know that. But the majority will never be told that information. Now, that's a game changer if you believe in reincarnation. It totally makes you view life in a totally different way of even maybe why you're experiencing this particular life. <clears throat> if there are lifetimes before, can you see? But again, it's all come from a situation where we've power, fear, division um, has kept the, the truth. Um, away from a lot of people. And so all religions are no different than what I've said. It's dualism. And the only way that we're going to have no wars, no fear, no discrimination is through unity. Is, and that ultimately is what we're seeking. And that can only come when <clears throat> human beings evolve their consciousness. So when we evolve our consciousness through meditational techniques, we leave the little self, the little separate self. We may be a little separate self, but I'm a little British separate self. Can you see? Mm. So now you're a little self, little separate self, but you're also a little country self as well. And we disagree with you and because you're not the same as us. This division, it's a nonsense. But when we actually evolve and our consciousness leaves the little fearful self, and we're in the collective, we become collective. Then we become a world. We work, we won't be having uh, different people like America and Russia and, you know, in the UN and <clears throat> all these. Why have they got all these alliances? It's fear. It's fear. And we've got to, we will eventually overcome this. We will eventually, but the only way it's going to be done is through the evolution of the human being. Yes. And I think Carl Jung said, he said, don't ever underestimate yourself as one person creating changes mentally, emotionally. He says, because you are part of a collective unconscious. So your consciousness, when you thrive, when you make a different a leap into a different level of consciousness or awareness, you have affected the collective unconscious of mankind. That's fascinating to me. Yes. Because uh, and, and it, I can it, it con conceptually, I suppose, not, which is not the same as experiencing mm -hmm. it. But again, back to Descartes, that I'm brought up in this conversation, in this discourse, that things are separate. I think that's normal and natural and how it's always been. But actually, it's just <clears> a particular <throat> conceptual framework for living. And that the antidote and antithesis of fear is love. Yeah, it's the opposite. Yeah. Love is the opposite love. of fear. Yes. And <clears throat> love is unity. Fear is separation. And... That's that's ultimately, I think, what we're we're striving for, what we're going to, what we're trying to achieve. And it's interesting actually because the more you work with meditation, the more you evolve, the more knowledge you have. The psychic gifts are just, as I said to you, they're just uh, byproducts. People think they're wonderful because you know you have knowledge of things that most people don't have, but it's just a byproduct. But ultimately, the more you develop, the more that you understand, the less you want or need. Yes. Yeah, because I'm satisfied and fulfilled with, with all that I am, which is, which is everything, I suppose, right? Okay, I, I want to move this on a little bit, right? So you do the meditation, okay. and you get really, really yeah. skilled, and then you have access to talking to spirits. Yes. And then, because I know when I met with you, and we, you and I, we sat across a room, and you keyed into 
I don't know, whatever, a spiritual plane or something. And you're <clears throat> talking to spirits. And, you, and I said, what are you doing? You said, you're talking to, uh, afterwards, right? There's spirits and you see them and the spirits would guide you. So, so but, but, and, and I remember, because I asked you this, and this was a few weeks before. And I said to you, I'm, something had happened that day in the news, maybe in Europe or something, about vaccine passes. And I said to you, are they going to happen? And he said, don't worry, it's not going to happen in England. And I, and I was thinking to myself, God, I hope he's right. I hope he's true. I, I hope this turns out to be correct, right? Because I don't know. But you said, no, no, no. don't worry, it's not going to happen. But also the other, two of the other um, psychics that I'd seen spoken to in October had both said the same thing separately. It's not going to happen in England. It's all going to disappear, you know, early spring and stuff. Don't worry, it's not going to happen in England. So how do you know and how do they know what's coming down the line? Is, is it like time is not linear? See, that's, <clears throat> that's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> time is only linear when it's connected to ego. So when we're in the ego, that personality, that's very much where time is uh, very real. And it becomes linear. You know, so time is connected to consciousness. When you're unconscious, there's no time. Um, <clears throat> so the spirit beings are not limited by linear time. <clears throat> past, present, and future, they can access. And they have a knowledge, and they do know these things. But this brings up a crucial question, which is a, another debate in itself, is, um, is this is there free will? Is there free will? <clears throat> or is, as um, Einstein believed, um, no, there isn't. That it's all part of a particular plan that can then be seen. <clears throat> But that's another that's another question Whoa. in itself. Whose plan? What plan? <coughs> Who wrote the plan? Well, well, that's what I'm saying. It's the divine plan. I don't know. It's um, I'm trying to use, trying to remember the word actually that Einstein used. It was a uh, I can't think of it now. But it was as if everything was just part of what was going to be. Um, <clears throat> so, but they do seem to have an access to knowledge about everything. So, for instance, okay, when I got that information, that just came to me, so I knew it was right. I've had. What I'm experimenting with now with clients, <clears throat> just because I'm having some fun with it, each person that comes, I'm asking the spirit world to give me the number on their front door. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm getting it right nine out of ten times. It's because <clears throat> now, when you think about that, you've got somebody in front of you you've never met, and you give them information that's correct, and then you end up giving them the number on their front door. Now, look how many numbers there are. Yeah. No, it's look likely, how many numbers. It's likely I mean, to be, you know, between one and a hundred, because most yeah. streets are small, but it could be, you know, streets with hundreds but, and thousands of numbers. Well, yeah. But, yeah, but one in 100. Yeah. You know, that's still a and lot you're getting it, you know, nine out of 10 times. <clears throat> it's quite interesting. But the other thing is, I remember my wife was pregnant with our second child and we were just having breakfast. And I said, <clears throat> Oh, well, I heard, actually, from the spirit. And I said, oh, you're going to have a cesarean for this, um, the birth of this child. And she said, oh, thank you very much, Dean. That's lovely. You know, she said, how do I know that's not just you saying that? And I said, no, really. I said, I just heard it. So you're going to have a cesarean for this. And she said, well, prove it to me. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, get some more information about something you don't know. I went, okay. So I asked my, my helper, my guide, and he said, tell her she's got 13 pence in her purse. So I said to her, you've got 13 pence in your purse. And I said, where's your handbag? We went upstairs, found her handbag, emptied the purse on the bed, and there was 13 pence in her purse. Now, when you start having this type of thing happen to you over and over again, <clears throat> your perception of reality changes. Mm. It can't help but. And it just shows you that there is an intelligence <clears throat> That is incredible, but we can access it. That's the exciting thing. That's okay, exciting. We can access it through meditation and your course, <coughs> a link in the description below, Think Right, Be Right, is a way of accessing it. Okay, and then you get access to, you may get access to these spirit guides who are then able to share their information and stuff. And then you make it available because you offer personal readings. Why do you do that? What's some of the stuff that you've, how have you helped people? You know, some examples, please. 
I actually have um, I have a doctor at the moment, a GP, who sends me <coughs> patients um, who are severely depressed because they've lost loved ones, and they're on medication and things, and they're not getting better. After they've been to see me, and I've connected them with their lost husband or mother or whatever, and given them evidence and proof that they live on, <coughs> they no longer need medication, and they actually are cured. Because they no longer have the grief. Okay. Do, do you know, um, I, after I saw you, because you told me stuff about my mum. Yeah. And then also after, in fact, after the two other readings, one of them was, was, a, was a medium. The other was a psychic. Yeah. And the medium, <clears throat> my mum came through again. And a lot of what you said matched what that medium said. And it was all yeah. about my mum. And I found it so fulfilling and yeah. loving and rewarding, you know, that my mum was watching over me and the messages that she had for me and for my children. I, I know my mum would have loved the fact that my children never went to school. My mum was a teacher and my children have never been to school. They've been home educated, which you didn't know, right? No. At least you didn't say if you did, right? I didn't know. But, <laughs> but my mum would have loved that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely loved that. And um, she, with the medium, she said that. She said, you know, she's so proud of how what my wife and I've done with our kids and stuff. So I found it very rewarding and fulfilling. So I can get what you said about people with depression, that it restores, yeah. it heals that hurt of the loss of that person. That's right. But you, so you see, you think that there's a loss because we haven't, we don't see them physically um, because they're in a different dimension. But the interesting thing is that we do actually um, visit them and, and, and are with them during sleep. And that's why, but that's why um, we can actually have the most incredible dreams sometimes. We think it's a dream and we're with them. <clears throat> and I, I, don't don't my, I don't remember my dream. So what would I do? What can I do? Okay. So let's change that thought. So when you go, remember, energy follows thought. So what you do is when you, um, before you go to sleep, you start to reprogram your mind and you start to say, um, I'm going to remember my dreams now from now on. And so you're making a statement, and that so and so it is. So the universe now is saying, "Oh, he's going to remember his dreams now." So remember what we think, we manifest. So just know that's going to happen, and over a period of time, that will then start to happen. And the interesting thing, when you dream of them, it's fascinating because when you see them, you say, "It can't be you because you're dead." And this is a common thing that people say. And I say, "That's right. You you actually become conscious within the dream." And but you're actually in the astral world and you're and you're seeing them. And one of the things that they've all talked about as well is their faces are normally very shiny, shining. And again, I want to take you back to pop music and happy shiny people. <laughs> yes. Right. Now, the reason, people. and again, maybe there was maybe a few experiments done with maybe drugs or things like this, but again, they would have been able to access those realms. Right. Okay. And seeing the happy, shiny people. And so believe I, it, they shine. Okay, so but what happens to people who do bad things in the spirit world? Oh, in what way? Well, like, you know, I deal with people who abuse children, who abuse their partners, pedophiles, wife batterers, you know. Okay. How them in the spirit world? Oh, so when they, they go over to the other side? Yeah. Okay, so... Those type of people, you know, if you look at the Christian faith and some of the others, they say, you know, those type of people, off they go, down on the, the elevator, down. You know, they're off to hell. <clears throat> but let's look at why people behave in a certain way. People that behave in a very depraved, depraved way, um, why? <clears throat> the people who are the worst people on the earth are the most fearful people on the earth, the most separate people on the earth. They think of nobody else but themselves and their own gratification of whatever that is, whatever the gratification is. So <clears throat> what happens is when they go over to the other world, they are no longer restricted by that viewpoint of their small self, the ego. So they are then given an opportunity to actually uh, be shown what and who they've been and what they've done, how they've harmed or hurt. And they then see themselves in the true light but not by that restricted small ego itself. That's stripped away. They're kind of like laid bare. And they recognize, and they can feel the suffering. They can feel the pain that they've caused on others. And it overwhelms them. But there was a transition 
that takes place over a period of time. There is no <coughs> judgmental God. There is the judge is self. And so then there is a, a, a progression that takes place. And apparently, what I'm told is the other world is that it will reflect your mental state. So as I said to you here, what we think we can manifest, money, this, that, everything else, love, whatever it is in our life. But And it takes maybe a little bit of time, days or weeks or months, but it does happen. But in the other world, it's instant. <clears throat> so you're, what you are or how, what you believe still, or if you're restricted, you will create a landscape or an environment that will reflect your state of mind. And there are certain beings which we call <clears throat> in the lower astral world. The lower astral, obviously, is the lowest part of the astral. There's a higher astral world. And the lower, and down in these areas, is these type of people you're talking about. But beings from the higher realms do go down regularly. When I say go down, reduce frequency. And, and appear in the lower astral worlds in order to instruct and show them the error of their thinking and their ways and give them an opportunity to progress. So there is not this thing of you are in hell and damnation forever. It's once there is an understanding. I mean, so let's have a look at simple. You and every person that's probably listening now has made mistakes, problems. We've, we've made a mistake. <clears throat> now, when you recognize that and you behaved in a certain way, you go, when you think back, you go, you know. But if you're not that person now, should you be condemned? Hmm. If you're still that person, you will then have that reflection in the astral world, definitely, and feel condemned, and your landscape will reflect that. But if you can move to a point and say, I'm not that being anymore, I understand now why I did that. I was fearful, I was scared, I, I needed to belong, or whatever. Hmm then we don't need to suffer anymore. So, you know, all these particular people that have been on the earth, I mean, most horrible people, they all have the same opportunity, you know, in order to progress. Progression is open to every human soul. Which, is, you know? which is very, very uplifting. It's very uplifting. Well, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful because there's purpose. And there's purpose and there's opportunity. And if we make mistakes, it doesn't mean that's the end of things. It means that we just move on. Can you say? Yeah. Yeah, I can get but, it. Okay. Okay. I want to move this on a little bit more because there are things I want to cover. So yeah. when you did the reading with me, as well as talking to spirits in the room, yeah. and telling me about my life that was accurate, yeah. you <clears throat> used tarot cards. Now, to mm -hmm. me, they're just cards with images on them. But you turn them over and, and then you tell me stuff. And that stuff that you told me was accurate. I'm like, what, what, what is that about? What's the rationale? How do they okay. work? So, so the interesting thing is, okay, so the byproduct of developing the mind is you develop psychic abilities to sense things, to know things. But also then you can develop the mediumistic ability to be able to connect with people who have passed over. And then <clears throat> the tarot, what, the reason I use that, is if anything's been missed, if I've not brought something through. So the tarot, if you look at the tarot, it actually is um, all these pictures on it, but it's like the beginning and the end of something. So it actually depicts life. So all the pictures within the tarot depicts life, every aspect of it, love, birth, happiness, contentment, sadness, destruction, every possible thing. And it's within the tarot. So when you apparently shuffle randomly and then give me the cards, again, you see, those cards aren't, there is no random. There is, this is where I actually feel that it's a perfect reflection of where you're at and what you're doing and what is, your, what is coming up. It's a reflection. So the universe is giving a perfect reflection of that. So when I look at those cards and I see that, I can see where you are on your journey because I've studied them and I, I know what they, they mean on the journey. But the interesting thing is, <clears throat> say, for instance, I see there's conflict with a young man because one of the cards, maybe the, one of the cards is the Page of Swords. Now, the Page of Swords in the tarot would mean that that page would be a younger man, it could even be your son. I would then find out, because Swords is connected to the element of air, I know that that particular card will be connected to somebody with a birthday that is either Libra, Aquarian, or Gemini. 
because those are the elements that connect to the element of air. And so if I asked you, is your, have you got a son because it's a younger person because it's a page, not a knight or a king? And you'd say, yes, that's a uh, certain. I'd say, is it Libra and Aquarius? And you'd say, yes, it's Aquarius. So I've got your conflict, as I'm saying, is with your son, and they are maybe Aquarian or whatever that is. Okay. Just to remind you, so one, I don't have a conflict with my son, but when we did the reading, you told me that he's Leo and that he's 17. Okay. Well, he if is. I told you that in whatever that was when I was working in that way. So yeah. if you, if we, if we Which did. Um, yeah. So if I, what I'm trying to say to you is though, with that, if I'm doing that, and I'm looking at that card, and then what I would use is my, I'd ask the spirit world, I'd say, who is this person? And they may even give me his, give me your son's name. Yeah. So I'm using a psychic, reading a book of where you are at the moment in your life plan, because you've chosen these cards, which exactly is a replica, reflection of what the universe, where you are. And then I can see what's going on. And then I can add, ask the spirit world to give me all the little bits of the icing on the cake. Can you see? Mm. I mean, it, it, it's fascinating. But the interesting it, thing is, c can you change it? <laughs> this is the thing people say to me is if you're seeing something that's coming up and it's not looking particularly great, can you change it? Yeah. That's what they've asked. Yeah. And the, there is always the potential you can, but the likelihood is you won't. Right. I remember um, in October last year, one of the psychics said to me, you're going to lose somebody close to you. Mm. And the medium told me that your father has got a UTI, my father. And my father did have a UTI. And then my father passed away a couple of weeks ago. And it was like, how did they know? How did they know? Now, it, that's not something that I could have necessarily changed because he's over in Pakistan and, you know, almost 90 years old. But th if you would have drawn the tarot cards, would they have shown up the same as yeah. this other psychic in each time? How does that happen? <clears throat> Yeah, because what would happen is that's the reflection of what's coming up for you. So, for instance, <clears throat> when is your dad's? Uh, when sorry, when, sorry, when was Stephen. your dad? Sorry, Stephen. sorry. Just, just thought it's the tarot. It's like how would the, like, who's doing the tarot that it keeps coming up the same? It's, a, it's, it's well, what's happening is the tarot will reflect what's coming up. So, as I just said to you, yep. the universe is going to show you. So, it, you're, you're people think that when you're shuffling them that you're getting those cards. It's random. It's not. Yeah, I think of it like, you know, playing, if we, we're going to play poker or something like that and shuffle an ordinary pack of cards. Yeah, it's not. It's not random. It's, it will be perfect. To, but the cards, as they come out, will be just as they are were going to come out. This is where the big question of free will comes in again. Okay, so this is where, you know, and with your father, tell me, for instance, um, when his birthday was. What was he? February the 9th. Okay, so he's an Aquarian. Okay. So... <clears throat> And I just said Aquarian a minute ago, didn't I? <laughs> Actually, all right. But the interesting not thing, is, not a young man though. <laughs> but, but no, I'm not. I'm not working in that way at the moment. But yeah. so if I looked at him, he would show as the king. So he would show as the king of swords. Okay, and there would be maybe the death card in the tarot on top of that. Right. Which would then death doesn't always mean in the tarot that it is going to be a passing. But if you have that with another card that's, that I recognize, then I would then say that that would probably be the probability. And, you know, the interesting thing is, the interesting thing with these cards is they're so accurate to time. They are more accurate with time than when you get information from the spirit because the spirit are in a realm where time isn't present. So, the ta so they, their timing can be a little off. But with the tarot, it can be perfect. Let me give you an instance, okay? This lady said to me, I'm going to see my daughter in Australia and I want – her to have a sitting with you. And I said, well, bring me some tarot cards in, I said. And I said, so when you're, you know, when you see her or whatever, wherever she was, I said, get her to shuffle the cards and then put an elastic band on them and then bring them back to me. So she went off to Australia, got a daughter to shuffle the cards, <clears throat> brought them back to me. And I said to her, all the information, okay, I said, is she pregnant? She said, yes, she is. Okay. But the interesting thing, the way these cards were laid out, and I know the timing, I said, I don't know how far she's gone. I said, but she's going to have this baby in three days' time. Three days' time, I told her. She had that baby three days later. <laughs> when you see this and you experience it, 
people can poo poo and they can it's do all It's just sort of luck. Things. You just picked a number yeah, out yeah, of yeah. was I mean, it how is that? 201 luck? and 270. <laughs> how's that luck? Yeah. Even told her three days. Yeah. Didn't even know she was pregnant. Yeah. But but the information was there. So when she shuffled those cards, it reflected her perfectly. Okay. But but what is it in the tarot that invests them invest the tarot with that power? It's not. Um, if you look at it, uh, so the tarot, the, the symbols in the tarot. So, for instance, okay, let me give you an instance. So the pictures, one of the the symbols in the tarot. Say we've looked at the hermit card, the hermit. The hermit is a picture of a man carrying a lamp, but next to his cave. So he spends a lot of time on his own. Okay. Now, if somebody was shuffling the cards and that was one of the first cards that came out, that person is alone. They're lonely because it's depicting it in the hermit. That's what they've attracted. That's the reflection. Um, there's another one. If you pick, uh, if I pick with somebody to shuffle the cards and then they showed me the Hierophant. So there's a picture of the Hierophant and he's in all his regalia and all the rest of it. What is a Hierophant? A Hierophant is a teacher. Now, they can be a religious teacher or a teacher, but generally speaking, they're a teacher. So if I saw that, I'd say, are you a teacher? And they'd say, yes, I am. It would reflect. Can you see? That's amazing, because you had me shuffle the cards. The other tarot reader that I spoke to, we did it online. She shuffled the cards. And then here's what's fascinating. When, when you and I had the reading, you didn't talk to me about money. That didn't come up in our reading. With this, with the medium and the tarot card psychic, just a lot came up about money, and it was the same. It was the same. And then my wife has had readings with both those psychics, with the psychic and the medium, and what they told my wife about our marriage and about our finances was the same. Yeah, <clears throat> because it reflects in your wife, so they'll be able to pick well, up. It's the our same finance. Thing. It's our. It's our money. Yeah, they pick up the same thing because it's yeah. the. They pick up the same thing. That's amazing. It's, a, it's quite incredible. But what it shows is that there's a synchronicity going on. There is a um, cause and effect somewhere going on. There's things going on. This is the interesting thing. There's far more going on, but we're not aware of it. Mm. And the average human being is still me messing around with their, their small self, their little part of themselves. And so they're not aware of the larger picture that is going on. When we work through meditation and develop, you then become far more aware of this. My teacher, Yogi John, with the tarot once, he, he put five cards down. You couldn't see them because they were turned the other way. And he picked the first card up. And this is what amazed me. It was a certain card. And he said, that means the next card must be the Ten of Cups. As he turned it over, it was. He said, the next card will be the One of Wands. It was. It was. It was. And I said, how did, you, how did you know that? How did you know, after seeing one card, that those cards would then be in order of what you've just said? And he said to me, because, Stephen, where I can see, that's the only way it could ever be. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I know. Amazing. I know. It's completely amazing. And I then know. What Okay, so people come to you for readings. This GP sends people over for, de for depression. I came to you because of you know, certainty and I wanted to know how life was going to roll out. And people come yeah. to you for all sorts of reasons. Do people come to you again and again? Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. And the thing is, I've seen thousands of people. Do you know the interesting thing is, is that often I say to them, have I seen you before? And they say, yes, yes, yes. And, I, and some, one lady I remember seeing, and I said, have I seen you before? She said, yeah, she did four weeks ago. But I don't remember. Because when you're doing it properly, what I'm actually doing is um, I'm actually, my brain waves are in between uh, beta, which is the normal state most people are in, and alpha, which is more really normally when you're unconscious. Normally, you're in a dream state when you're in alpha. Now, I'm talking to you, and I'm, I'm partly in beta and partly in alpha as I'm talking to you. Uh, not fully in alpha, because if I was doing that, I would be connecting more uh, psychically and spiritually. Yeah, and we, so we, we, you, we want to stay connected through IT right now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so, but, you know, and, but when you think about it, when you have a dream, <clears throat> when you do dream, because I know you're trying to get a dream, but how long is it when you wake up in the morning and you remember it? How long is it by the rest of the day it's gone? Mm. 
it's gone. But that's what happens with me, you see. So I work with somebody. I'm working more within the subconscious or the, at, at the alpha state. And I'm given the information, but then when it's finished, I forget. And I even forget the person sometimes. And I can see, I've saw him, seen them four weeks ago. And I say, have I seen you before? And they, they've sat with me for an hour. Yes. Can okay. you see? Yeah. <clears throat> just on that, and, and, and I need to wrap this up. I could carry on with you for hours and hours and hours, right? I just so appreciate this conversation and, and you taking the time out. And I, I'm going to invite people to come to you for reading. They want to contact you for reading. <clears throat> is, is there an email on the, on the website? Um, <clears throat> yeah, there is an email uh, that can, um, yes. So if okay. I give you the d- details, well, I'll get Nicola to give you the details. Right, so, so I have the email. And then, uh, now, I, I have been meditating. I just never recognized it as such because I take power naps and I listen to isochronic tones and I've been listening to theta, wave, theta waves, right? And okay, maybe I should try alpha waves or something like that, right? But I'm, I'm interested in the meditation course, so I will be looking it out myself. Okay, well, that's, that's interesting. The, but the, the thing is, if you follow it, <clears throat> everything that I'm doing in it, I did. So I know it works. Yeah. So if you follow it, and you do it properly, you will develop. You will have that great understanding, knowledge, and the psychic uh, abilities will flourish. They will come forward if you just follow what I'm saying. And then the advanced course that I've just finished, that's, ooh, that's a little bit heavier. That's, um, that's about the concepts we've talked about, about non-duality and about the greater understanding of self and the world. And... Um, and how you can manifest, we know we can manifest anything, but it's really showing you how you can, you can literally have anything you want. <laughs> but remember, the most important thing is, is that really I'd say, as we're leaving or wrapping this up, the most important message I can really give is don't want too much for yourself. Have enough and then be of service to others and then you'll have a contented and happy life. Absolutely, absolutely. And I would, um, you know, if anybody who's skeptical and is watching this and stuff, whether or not you ever reach the psychic plane or not, the astral plane, meditation is good. It's really, really good for you. It's like, you know, if, if I just try that out, right, that, will, that would be great. Meditation is amazing for you because you wake up. We're asleep. The majority of people have said you wake up. And you just said something about if people reach the astral plane. Can I say they're guaranteed to? <laughs> Oh, Stephen, Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. It's thank been you. a pleasure. A hundred million times thank you. And I'll have okay. all the links in the description below. Really, if people want to pay you, they're in the US or Australia or whatever. PayPal, do you take cryptocurrencies? Yeah, yeah, they, all, all of that. And it's if you go to the website, it's all in detail and they can follow that through. Uh, yeah, so there's no problem. Fabulous, fabulous. Okay. Stephen, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And anybody pleasure. who's watching, please comments, questions. I know this is kind of different, but... But I suppose what got me into Bitcoin was being willing to explore outside conventional forms yes. of knowledge. And the same with why I went into home education, because I'm willing to explore what else is out there. It's progression. Progression. Yes, progression. discovery. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so comments, questions in the description below. Follow me on Crypto Rich BTC, my new YouTube channel, because I'm shadow banned on the other one. And also on Odyssey, Crypto Rich BTC. Join my official Telegram announcement channel. Follow me on Twitter. And between now and when I see you next, please keep filling your pockets with psychic profits. This is Crypto Rich and Psychic <laughs> Stephen signing out. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you later. Stay-